Yeah, this, this is just right after the, there. Now, <laughs> boy, I love that song. Wasn't that beautiful? Whew. Mercy. If you couldn't feel that, your battery is dead. You need to do something about that. So how are you doing with the 30 days of uh, thanks, 30 days of no complaining? Uh, just one question, does that include the weather? <laughs> if it does, then, then I'm afraid I have failed. I have complained about the weather. And I, I, know, I know some of you, you are, you're, not, you're counting the days until December the 1st. You're not complaining, but you're compiling a list. And it won't be long, we'll be hearing from you, I'm sure. I'm so happy to see you all here today. Blessing of God. It's just a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing to rest in and rejoice in and celebrate. And what a difference it makes when we come together to do that celebrating. I love the uh, intergenerational aspect of our church. I really love that. Uh, the oldest of the old and the youngest of the young, there's room for everybody, there's a need for everybody, and everybody enriches the lives of everybody. I love talking to kids. Between the services, I talked to this young man. I said, now what grade are you in? He said, I'm in the first grade. He sounded very proud of that. First grade. I said, well, I'm in the second grade. <laughs> he said, no, you're not. You're ready to retire. <laughs> <laughs> Another good-looking kid, I said, How, what grade are you in, young man? He said, I'm in the sixth grade. He said, you did a good job of talking this morning. I said, well, thank you. He said, you look like the bad guy on Transformers. <laughs> I'm going to have to check that out. I have no idea. <laughs> then again, maybe I won't check that one out. <laughs> Let's look in Psalm 100. I think there are inducements and encouragements there in cultivating a spirit of thanksgiving. I want to be a more thankful person. How about you? Amen. Don't you think there's room for improvement in most of our lives? To be more thankful, more cognizant of the, the abundance of God's blessings, and you don't have to look long. You don't have to look far to find it. It might be sitting right next to you. It might reside within you, the spirit of the living God. Psalm 100, I'm reading from the NIV, New International Version. Um, and it starts out with the word shout, and already some of you are nervous. Shout! For joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. And then the connective, for the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. These words are informative and inspirational. In fact, the inspiration is built on the information in this psalm. I pray the Lord will help me to provide a little of both of those this morning. Now, uh, everything's about context. Biblical words, phrases, all about context. Uh, the writings of the Bible, not only the context of language, the context of culture. The preparation and delivery of sermons, all about context. Because they flow into a life and out of a life. And I prepared this sermon on being thankful, interestingly enough, with a, a dental appointment on the schedule. 
Now, I understand for some of you, going to the dentist is just no big deal. I don't know if it has something to do with that gas that they offer or not. I don't know. Some of you actually look forward to going to the dentist so you can get a free toothbrush and a tube of toothpaste. But for me, I confess a real sense of dread. Now, it's not, it's not that I don't like my dentist, Dr. Rich Driller. Uh, I, I mean, I know he's pulling for me. I, I've had some of the crowning moments of my life have been in a dental chair. But do you, do you not feel just so vulnerable sitting in the dentist chair? You know, with your feet ab above your head and your, and your mouth w wide open under a bright light? Uh, could you just turn here a little bit and tilt back a little bit? No, okay, over here like this. Powerless, absolutely powerless. But beyond that, beyond the physical restraints and limitations of it all, beyond that, my fear and dread, I think, originate out of a hyper-imagination that tends to take me places where I shouldn't go. I mean, I'm afraid the dentist is going to come in someday and he's going to say, well, everything has to go. We'll put in 32 implants. It's going to cost you $30,000, but you will have a smile that lights up the room. I don't want to light up the room. I just want to go home. That's all I want. So, it was a good time for me to have this psalm so readily available to me and to focus on the content of it. The psalm talks about joy. <laughs> you got joy? Talks about worship. Are you a worshiper? It talks about gladness, singing, praising, and thanksgiving. So let's see if we can get a little closer to what David is saying. And I, I see three categories of words, three kinds of words in this psalm. First of all, words that invite. I want you to look at the first word of invitation, and in the King James Bible, it's in the first verse, and it's the word come. Come before Him with thanksgiving. That's a lovely word, isn't it? Come. It really is that word of invitation. Come and see. Come and find. Come and experience. Come and dine. Come and fellowship. That's God, by the way. The Father says, come now, let us reason together. The Son says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And in the last book of the Bible, the Spirit and the bride say, come. That's God. God is an inviting God. God says, come. I'm interested in you. I want your fellowship. I, I want you to learn of me. Come. In this day of grace, God never holds up his hand to resist or reject or repel. He always extends his hand to lovingly invite. The door is open. The red carpet is rolled out. The invitation is given. Come. Come as you are, and I'll make you what you can be. Come. I give comfort for mourning, beauty for ashes, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. There's a second word of invitation here, and that's the word in verse 4, enter. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Now, that is a very interesting order of events. Follow me. Thanksgiving doesn't follow entering his gates. It accompanies it. Praise doesn't start in the courts. It's already in place. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. In fact, the implication here is that, that everything here, the, the joy, the worship, the gladness, the singing, the praising the Lord should so be on our minds, should so dominate our lives that as we come, as we enter, they're already in our hearts and upon our lips. 
We should be in a constant state of visiting God's goodness, God's love, God's faithfulness, so that praise is never far from our lips. When Sunday gets here, we, we should be ready and waiting with joyful songs and thankful hearts because we've been doing it all week because it's a way of life, an inspired life. Secondly, not only words of invitation, but also words of, that inform. Words of invitation, words of information. Now, admittedly, you can't help but note, this is a highly inspirational psalm. It's got a lot of emotions in it, doesn't it? It speaks of shouting and joy and gladness and singing and praising and thanksgiving. Sort of like the people yesterday on the uh, Iowa State football game on the Iowa State side. <laughs> Not so much the Baylor side. <clears throat> I can't blame you a bit, Pastor. I can't blame you. <laughs> uh, you know, that is not a good thing to do for job security's sake. It just really isn't. Yeah. Oh, my. Some people say there should be no emotion in religion. I've encountered people. I've had conversations with people about that. And uh, context, usually... These are people who have little emotion about anything. Mr. Spock and Mrs. Stoic, Deacon Dead Battery, Brother Zombie and Sister Robot. You don't get that from the Bible. No, you don't get that from the Psalm. You don't get that anywhere from David. He talks about shouting for joy. He talks about worshiping with gladness, singing joyful songs, vocalizing thanksgiving and praise. So there's a lot of inspiration in the psalm, but my dear friends, it's also certain that you cannot build a Christian life on emotion. You do that, that's a setup for a disaster. Why? Because emotions cannot be relied upon. No, they are tricky. Emotions will fail you. They will lie to you. They will deceive you. They will set you up, and then they will let you down. Now, David's experience certainly includes emotion, but it exceeds emotion. Take note that David also has an intellectual component to his faith. That's why he talks about knowing in verse 3. It's not just a matter of feeling, although that's okay. But in verse 3, know. you got to know some things. Know that the Lord is God. Inspiration built on information. Information without inspiration, you dry up. Inspiration without information, you blow up information and inspiration, you grow up. Yes. Know what you believe and why you believe it. I, I, too many folks are like the, the guy that uh, was asked, well, what do you believe? And he said, well, I believe what my church believes. The gentleman said, well, what do they believe? He said, well, they believe what I believe. Well, what do you and your church believe? We believe the same thing. <laughs> and honestly, I think some people are that way. They don't know what they believe or why they believe it. They just know it sounds good, and more importantly, it feels good. Inspiration for inspiration's sake. Not a lot of foundation, not a lot of substance to that. They are the antithesis to Jack Webb. Now, some of you don't know what antithesis is, and some of you don't know who Jack Webb is. This is really effective communication on my part. Well, some of you are too young to know who Jack Webb is. Google him. 
The, how many remember Jack Webb? Yeah, all right, good deal. That cool, never ruffled, all business, Jack Webb's famous line was, just the facts, ma'am. That's a good cop. And to be a good Christian, you need to be a little like Jack Webb. You need to be interested in some facts. And David says, know some things. First of all, in verse 3, he said, know that the Lord is God. And when he's talking about God, he's not talking about one of many. He's talking about the one God, the true God. The Almighty God, four times he calls him Lord. Adonai in the Hebrew, Lord, Master, Ruler, the one absolute and who is in absolute control, Lord over all. Know that the Lord is God and there is none other. Then he said, know that he has made us in verse 3. It's he who has who, who made us, and we are His. Now, listen, that will never be outdated. Mm -mm. That'll never be trumped. It'll never be replaced. He made us, and we are His. God is our Creator. He's our rightful owner. We didn't just evolve over eons. We're, we aren't accidental accumulations of mutated cells. Almost all of science agrees that we came from a common parentage, a man and a woman. Evolutionists tell us it took millions and millions and millions of years of the evolutionary process, all directed by nothing and nobody, for the first human to arrive. And then lo and behold, I guess the second one showed up at the same time. And as fate would have it, one was a man and one was a woman. It takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does creation. It takes more faith to believe in the constantly modified theories of evolutionary thought than it does to believe it is He who made us made us from the dust of the earth. By the way, there are, the human body consists of some 28 trace and base elements, all of which are found in the earth. So the two recent conclusions of anthropologists, evolutionists, sociologists, is that, uh, number one, we had a common parentage. Yeah, I know. I could have told you that. Why did you come talk to me? <laughs> and the others that, well, what's in you is in the dust of the earth. Yeah, that's exactly. We're so glad you caught up with us. <laughs> know that the Lord, He is God. He made us. Thirdly, know that He is our shepherd. Verse 3, we are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Well, now, who wrote this? Context. Who wrote it? David. David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and before David was a king and a warrior, David was a shepherd. And he never forgot that. He never forgot where he came from. He never forgot the lessons he learned about it. And so he's writing about it here as he has done in previous Psalms, namely Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. We are the sheep of his pasture. Why do we come to church? Oh, I guess uh, people can have a lot of reasons. I can tell you why I come. Uh, it's to gain knowledge about the living God and His kingdom and His will. I come to find inspiration to worship Him and to serve Him gladly and boldly on Monday. I come to learn more about Him, and as I learn more about Him, I love him more and more. Know that the Lord is God. Know that it is God who made us, that we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Words of invitation, words of information, and thirdly, my friends, words of inspiration. 
What inspires us to worship? What inspires us to sing, to shout, to have gladness and joy? Well, notice the connection and the transition in this psalm. David has spent the first four verses telling us what worship should look like. Now he tells us in verse 5, why? For, he says, number one, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. If you forget everything I say this morning, and chances are you will, would you just remember that? The Lord is good. Oh, how good he is. And it's a good thing that the Lord is good. Because if the Lord wasn't good, nothing would be right in the universe. God is good, and He's only good. If you can cross that hurdle, you're on your way to understanding God. I said God is good and only good. God is good, and He's always good. There is no day and no way when God is not good. There's never a time or situation, or circumstance, or a person with whom God doesn't act in accordance with His goodness. God is good. God is good all the time. That goodness, by the way, is extended to everyone, no exceptions. God is good to you because He loves you. As we've seen in verse 3, He made you. And would an all-wise and loving God make something or someone that He didn't love? And yet, some people go through life thinking that God is mean and that He's evil and He's got it in for them. God has never taken an action toward you or me that wasn't in keeping with the fact that God is good. You say, well then, why is life so ridiculously unpredictable? And why is life so hard? And why do I find myself entrenched with disappointment and pain and suffering? Because you and I live in a fallen world where evil people and evil powers are at work. We don't live under a protective dome where we are sheltered from life. But the Lord is good even when life isn't. The Lord is good even when others aren't. And David tells us in verse 5 that he says the Lord is good. And then he says, and his love endures forever. You want to talk about God's love? David certainly did. He, he says that his love extends in verse 1 to all the earth and to verse 5 to all generations. And in the New Testament, when Jesus showed up, he gave us the epitome and the fulfillment of this. And he pronounced to the world, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God loves saints. God loves sinners. Loves them big time. Always has, always will. Uh, Must have been a subliminal or subconscious thing this morning. I put this tie on. You can't tell from back there, but this tie is covered with black sheep. And it has one little white sheep. A dear, dear lady, an elderly saint in West Virginia gave that to me when I was pastoring. And She let me know in no uncertain terms that she was the white sheep. (laughs) And if you would know her, you would know she was not the white sheep. The next year, she gave me a tie in reverse order. I have it. It's all white sheep, except for one, a black sheep. She let me know in no uncertain terms, I'm the black sheep. God loves white sheep. God loves black sheep. When will his love run out? Well, David says in verse 5, his love endures forever. He has a love for all and a love forever. No limits. 
not qualitatively nor quantitatively, not in degree nor in duration. David says a third thing we should know in verse 5. He said, know that the Lord is good. Know that His love endures forever. And thirdly, know that His faithfulness continues through all generations. God is faithful in life and in death. God is faithful in pleasure and in pain. God is faithful when the sun rises, when the sun sets, and when the sun will be no more. And, uh, you know, we play the comparison game, you know, my lot in life, and uh, we kind of nurture a victim's mentality. All of us do that. I think all of us have fallen prey to that, which is one of our worst enemies, that victim's mentality. And some people might say, well, you know, that's easy for David to say. It's easy for him to talk about singing and praising and thanksgiving. After all, he's a king. He lived in a palace. He had all the comforts of royalty. Context. Nobody writes more about fear and loneliness and desertion and pain and unanswered prayers than David. When you look at his life, you see what looks like an incongruent, inexplicable absurdity of thanksgiving. But you see, it's based on a knowledge so powerful, so convincing, so deeply embedded in the soul that nothing can shake it. God is good. His love endures forever. He's faithful to all generations. He'll be faithful to you and to me. Faithful for all in all. Now that's something to be thankful for, isn't it? I could put a thousand things on my thankful for list and then add another thousand. But I got to tell you, as I thought about that list, the greatest blessing, the number one blessing, and I've got so many. I've got so many. I've got two kids I love so much. I've got a granddaughter I love even more. (laughs) I got a wife of 50 years. Hey, yeah, yeah. Can you believe she's done that? 50 years. I have a wonderful church family here. I've got a great pastor, friend. I've got so much to be thankful for. But at the top of the list, the greatest blessing, number one, is my salvation, the gift of eternal life. You see, when I read this psalm and David says, Lord, oh, I know who he's talking about. I have the completed version. I've got the full story. I have the Old Testament foreshadowing and the New Testament fulfillment. I know who he's talking about. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ who is mighty to save, able to save to the uttermost. And whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what are we talking about here? Sin and salvation, Lord, life and eternal life, heaven and hell. It's a matter of kingdoms. Which kingdom are you in? Darkness or light? Bondage or freedom? Despair or joy and hope and peace? Is Jesus your Lord? Would you bow your heads as we look to him in prayer? Faithful God, loving God, how great you are. Lord, when you saved us, you put a song in our hearts, an irrepressible song. We sing in prison at the midnight hour. We sing a song this world could never have given. And we sing a song the world can never take away. We're so glad for the discovery that took place, for the knowledge that was given and received, for the information that provides the inspiration, 
for the foundation and the substance of our faith. And we're so thankful Though, though it was and it is and it will ever be a walk of faith that we have seen enough dots connected, enough blanks filled in that we see the logic and the rationale of taking up our cross and following Jesus every day. Thank you, Lord, for transferring us out of that old kingdom, bringing us into the kingdom of glorious light and liberty. Now, my friends, while your eyes are closed, your heads are bowed for a brief moment. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Is He the Lord? Now, I'm not talking about a convenient add-on. I'm not talking about someone available just when you need them. I'm talking about someone that is the Lord of your life, who guides you and leads you. You seek His direction. You seek to honor and please Him. It's your mission now in life to serve Him. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Well, I'm here to tell you like hundreds in this church have done and countless millions around the world today and countless millions more through the ages have done. You can, you can make that happen today. All you have to do is say, Lord, come into my life. I yield to you. I surrender every shred of my existence to your Lordship because after all, you're worthy. You made me. You love me. Hallelujah. And every day can be lived out as a praise to God. If you haven't done that in your life, what are you waiting for? Haven't you seen enough to know that you're missing out so much? There's a living Lord waiting for you. He says, come, come. And he says, today is the day of salvation and now is the acceptable time. Yes, there's an urgency to it because he also said, let no man boast of tomorrow, for no man knows what a day may bring forth. We're going to stand, we're going to sing, and as we stand and sing, if you want to receive Jesus Christ into your life today, come, step out from where you are and come forward and say, here I am, Lord, I'm presenting my life to you. I don't care who sees me. You're more important than they are. Eternity is more important than the moment. And listen, if you're here today and you need prayer for any need in your life, you step out. You come forward and receive prayer today. Let us pray with you this morning.